Okay, so um, Pastor Drew uh, sh- told me to uh, to ten minutes and ten minutes. I have uh, I have 19 years in recovery, so it's gonna be. Re- I'm trying. Re- I'm gonna be really hard to share my testimony and the ministry it, it, on a on a like a speed dial. If you go on our website at streetlifeministries.org, uh, if you go to the bottom, there's the hour and 45 minute. Uh, uh, what is it? What is it? Um, uh, uh, what's it, uh, club, what is this, uh, what's the Christian channel? Uh, they came out and filmed, my wife and I, something 700, the 700 Club, thank you. Yeah, they came out and filmed, my wife and I, and did our testimony. So if you want to hear the long version, that's the long version. Um, so anyway, thank you so much for allowing me to be here this morning. I really do appreciate that. So PG-13 uh, testimony of Dave Sharon. So... Um, born and raised Redwood City, I w- my, the mom, uh, my mom who gave birth to me was 14 years old, um, and I was given up for adoption, and I was born um, what was called uh, uh, Mary's Hope Hospital, which is Seton, Daly City. Uh, back in the day, that was the hospital that uh, children like me were born in that were going to be given up for adoption. My mom and dad, uh, they adopted me. They were just barely married. My mom uh, found out really early on she couldn't have children, so they were looking for adoption. So they got my, me, my bundle of joy. And, um, and I was born and raised Redwood Shores, San Carlos, Redwood City, pretty much just this area all my life. I grew up in Redwood Shores when Marine World Africa USA was in, was in Redwood Shores, so I'm that old. Um, so went through, went through my childhood, my, um, my dad uh, was a truck driver, a teamster for Local 85 out of San Francisco, and um, very hard job, very, very demanding job. My mom was a stay-home mom. There was, a, there was such a time uh, back in the day when you could do that. Uh, <laughs> and um, my dad, my dad uh, at a very early age, uh, he was an alcoholic, and he, beca- and he got addicted to pain medication. My dad got really hurt at work. He, a, f- a forklift, he f- t- uh, went off a loading dock, and a forklift landed on him and broke his back. And, in or- and back then, Vicodin was like the cure drug. So they gave my dad buckets of Vicodin. My dad became very addicted to Vicodin and became an alcoholic. And somewhere between um, an innocent childhood into about uh, fourth or fifth grade, my house became a nightmare. Uh, my dad, like I said, he was an alcoholic. He was a drug addict. Um, I, became, um, I became the product I was um, physically um, uh, messed with uh, by, my, by my dad, uh, both kinds of physically messed with, I, trying to keep it PG-13. But I was, I, was, I was touched in a way as I shouldn't have been. Um, and so in order for my dad to overcome the guilt of that, then I became a punching bag. And so I was beaten and, and verbally abused in my home. And so right around, uh, right around fifth, sixth grade, um, I was at a, a teacher parent conference. And for the very first time, I got high. What, how did I get high? Well, they used to have these big, huge metal things that were like they, they would have coffee and water in. And I uh, stuck a bunch of uh, sugar cubes in a Dixie cup, filled it up with warm water, and I drank the sugar. And I got super high off the sugar. I was running around, like, and I, was, I enjoyed that high because it, it allowed me to escape the feeling I was having. So that became something that I started to pursue all through my childhood. I started stealing uh, alcohol to my dad's liquor cabinet. I started to steal the marijuana off his, out of his ashtrays. And I wanted to escape. I had no brothers and sisters. I didn't know who I was. My identity was just shattered because of all the stuff that was going on. And I just kept escaping, escaping, escaping. Got to high school. Um, I would love to tell you that I was, I was on the honor roll, but I was not. <laughs> I got to senior, uh, senior year in high school. You need 220 credits to graduate. I had 43. Uh, they, I went to Redwood Continuation School. Got all my credits caught up. Um, I, I became, uh, I was a drug dealer in school, and I, I basically uh, gave people free drugs to, to do my homework for me. I got my credits up to 220, went back to Woodside High School to graduate. As soon as they saw me come on campus, they called the security and the police. I wasn't allowed back on their campus. So the principal made a deal with my mom and I and my dad. They'll give me my, my diploma as long as I don't walk across the, the aisle. Just leave, just leave the school. And I was okay with that. I thought that was a great deal. So I got my, got my high school diploma. I left. Uh, 18th birthday, 
um, my dad looked at me and said, you're either going to go to college or you're going to pay rent. So I, obviously, as you can tell, I wasn't going to college. So next thing I know, I was getting sworn in. I was a teamster. I was driving a truck for a living and just kept, kept trying to escape who I was. Got really, really involved in alcohol and cocaine. Um, started, uh, started getting uh, uh, arrested and going to jail, McGuire Jail, which Drew would have come visit me if it was back then. Um, and then what ended up happening was I was at the age of 35, and um, I was living in Sunnyvale. I was living with a, uh, with a woman in Sunnyvale, and we were going through. She had a, uh, um, a, a, um, a J.P. Morgan account that we were going through. We were just tearing through her money, getting high. And I was going down El Camino, uh, going towards East, East Blythedale, and a stolen car, a gun, and methamphetamines. And I was getting ready to churn off of East Blyth- or El Camino onto East Blythedale to go to 101. I was going to take the stolen car to a guy I knew that could flip cars. And um, that means take the cars and tear them apart, just so you guys know what that means. Okay. Anyway, uh, right before I made the churn, I got pulled over by the Sunnyvale Police Department. Uh, I didn't realize that there was that many cops in Sunnyvale. Um, I got pulled out, got arrested. I was at uh, Elmwood County Jail. I was in the felony uh, uh, detention center. I was looking to do five years in prison. The judge, uh, the uh, San Jose Superior Court judge, was named Judge Manning. Um, anybody look him up? He, I didn't know it at the time, but he was a Christian. He looked, at my, he looked at my record, and he realized that I wasn't a criminal. He says, you're a drug addict. So he says, I'm going to make you a deal today. He says, I'm going to give you what's called a five-year suspended sentence. You're going to go to Salvation Army on West Taylor Street. I'm going to suspend your prison sentence for five years. But if you so as get a jaywalking ticket in the next five years, I'm going to put you in prison starting day one. And um, I took the deal. I went to Salvation Army. I was in Salvation Army. And this is where a lot of my whole, this is where my whole life just completely flipped over on its head. So I, I grew up in a home, obviously, mostly, I'm sure you could tell, I, I didn't have God in my house. And, and when I got to Salvation Army, I didn't hear the Salvation or the Army part. I just, all I knew is I wanted to escape prison. Well, at 4 o'clock in the morning when the drill sergeant's in your room yelling at you to make your bed, you, you get the Army part really fast. And then all of a sudden, you're, you're in chapel for three hours. And then you get the, the Salvation part. Well, they kept talking, and this is, you know, really... Drew, to, you know, um, uh, God, uh, you know, our, our good, good father. I mean, that song, you know, the, the thing is, is that I had such a horrible dad. And every time, they, every time I was in Salvation Army, they kept talking about God and father at this, in the same sentence. And it just repulsed me. Because I thought, you know what? I've already, I've, I was abandoned by the woman who gave birth to me. I don't even know who those people are. Then I, then I got adopted, and the dad who adopted me took, took, took advantage of me, and now you want me to fall in love with somebody who you're calling father. I didn't want to have nothing to do with a dad, right? Well, all of a sudden, I, I, uh, I, was, I was looking to get kicked out of Salvation Army. I know, I know you find that hard to believe. I was, got myself in trouble. And the guy, so Salvation Army, just so you guys know, people in recovery are running recovery. So the guy behind the counter was about six months sober, from me being like 30 days. Well, this guy and I, we didn't like each other. And what happened was, is a, Salvation Army is called an ARC program, and it's an adult re- rehabilitation center. So you know all the Salvation Army trucks that go around picking up the, all the stuff from your house? They go to certain spots, and then guys like me work in a warehouse, and we separate it all, and then it goes into their stores, and then the money that you pay for the stuff in those stores pay for me to get recovery. So when, you're, when you go in the warehouse, just really quick, at the time, I had a three-pack-a-day three, three pack a day cigarette habit, okay? Um, and so when I went in the warehouse, I, all I wanted to do was smoke a cigarette. But you can't smoke all day. Well, you can go in the warehouse. When you leave, you can, you're not allowed to take anything out of the warehouse. Well, what happens is, is when, you, when you get, when the bell whistle, when the bell whistles, everybody leaves. And you have, when you go into the barracks, it's considered a chapel, you can't wear a T-shirt and jeans. You have to dress out into, you have to wear a collared shirt and slacks all the time. And so I went upstairs. I went to go change out. I had a little teeny X-Acto knife, a little, a little razor blade in my pocket because my job was cleaning the stickers off of mirrors and glass furniture. I went downstairs. I told the guy, I said, hey, I, I brought this in on action. All I really wanted was a cigarette, this and that. The guy immediately started to write my termination papers up. 
and he started saying things to me that was really not I, PG-13. I don't want to repeat what he was saying to me. All of a sudden, it dawned on me that there was this one person there that everybody spoke to that I, I, I avoided like I, I avoided a lot. It was the chaplain because he kept talking about Jesus Christ. He t- kept talking about God, and I didn't want to have anything to do with God. But I know that everybody went to him when they were in trouble. So I left the front desk, and I went to his office, and he was in his office, and I slammed his door, and I looked at him and go, you need to get me out of this trouble. And I told him what was going on, and he says, I can't, I have no authority here. I can't do anything. He goes, but I do know somebody who can. And he goes, sure, who's that? Just point me in the right direction. And he goes, what's well, Jesus Christ? I'm like, ah. I go, here it goes. <laughs> Right, I go, here it goes. I'm getting set up, right? I go, come on. So then I felt like him and I went back and forth for about what felt like an hour, but was probably about 30 seconds. And I realized, okay, this guy's trying to hustle me into letting Jesus Christ be the conversation. And I'm trying to hustle him so I don't go to prison for five years. So I go, what do, what do you want me to do? He goes, I just want to pray over you. And I go, okay. And I figured once he gets done praying over me, he's going to pick up the phone and everything's going to be okay. So he starts praying over me. And I'll tell you what, okay, um, I've never had the encounter of the Holy Spirit in my entire life until this day. And he started praying over me, and next thing I know, I'm literally bawling in his office, and I can't stop crying, and I'm shaking, and I'm sweating, and I've got snot coming out of my face, and, and next thing I know, I'm, I'm confessing, and I'm, and I'm like, all the stuff that's happened to me as a kid, all the things I've done to other people, all the lies I told, it's just flipping out of my mouth, and I can't stop it. It's just like, just like coming out of me. And then he asked, and I felt like literally like I was like three and a half feet off the ground. And then he asked me, do I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? And I'm like, yes. And I'm like, I don't even know where these words are coming from, right? I'm like, yes. And so he prays over me. I, I do the Lord's Prayer. I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And it just stops. And I'm like, what the heck? Like, <laughs> what did you just do to me? You know, and he told me, he says, when you, when I was praying over you, what's happened was is the Holy Spirit was coming in and, the, and purging the evil out of you. He goes, you are, Second Corinthians 5.17 says, for those of us who c- confess the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are new. He goes, you were purged. The Holy Spirit and the, and, and the devil can't reside in the same spot because your soul has been refreshed. You're new. And I'm like listening to this guy. I have no idea what this guy's talking about. But I knew that I felt something I've never felt before. So all of a sudden we get ready. We're walking out of his office. And here comes the guy that was going to kick me out looking for me. And, I'm, and all of a sudden reality hits, right? I'm going to prison for five years. And the guy comes up and he goes to shake my hand. And he says, I want to apologize the way I was talking to you. The guy who was next to him heard how he was talking to me, and he says, I owe you an apology. I can't, I, we're not gonna, you're not getting kicked out today. And this guy, the chaplain, didn't do anything. I'm like, holy cow. I'm like, okay. So he says, you're going to get, sus- what's, I was going to get suspended. So I was getting removed from uh, Salvation Army on West Taylor and going to go over to their shelter program over on 4th Street for a 30-day suspension. And if I can do the 30-day suspension, I was going to come back over to West Taylor. And while I was over on 4th Street, my, uh, the judge wanted me, and my uh, district, the district, I'm sorry, the prosecutor wanted to meet with me. And I thought, man, this is it. They told him what happened. I'm done. I'm going to go, I'm going to go to, uh, I'm going to go to prison, right? I go over, I go over to force, I go over to the, the, the judge, I mean, I'm sorry, my, uh, the, the, the attorney, and he says, you're never going to believe what, what, what I'm going to tell you today. I'm like, well, man, let me tell you what happened to me. And uh, he, all my charges got dropped. The stolen car, the gun, and the meth all got dropped, all in one shot. So I was, I was looking at five years in prison, a five-year suspended sentence. I was going to, I was going to have multiple felons, felonies against my, my name, and all of a sudden it just, everything gets dropped. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And so I ended up, I, he asked, he says, you can go, you, you can leave if you want. And I, I asked him, I said, well, if Salvation Army is okay with it, can I finish the program? I says, I just accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I'm scared. I don't want to go out on the streets. I don't want to be homeless. So I went back to Salvation Army. They accepted me to, to stay. I graduated. I went to their sober living environment. And here's, here's some interesting things. As my life starts to transform, so I graduate from Salvation Army. And Salvation Army owns a bunch of homes in the, in, all over the Bay Area, actually. So there's a home in Sunnyvale 
that's a sober living home that I'm going to be able to stay there for 24 months as I start getting my life back together. Well, I didn't have a driver's license because, just so you guys know, I have a 26-year-old daughter um, that I had abandoned when, when, I, when my wife was pregnant with her. I abandoned them. And so the court system caught up with me, and I owe child support. Well, in order for me to get caught up, they suspended my commercial driver's license and my, my regular driver's license until I get back on the court system and start paying my child support. So I was subject to the bus. Well, if you want to know how God's got jokes, God's got jokes. So every day that I would stand at the bus stop to go to work, the bus stop I stood at was right where I got arrested with a stolen car. So I got to sit there, they scratching my head, thinking, thank God that I'm not that guy anymore. <laughs> and then um, I got attached to uh, Menlo, Menlo Church, and, and Menlo Park was the first church I started going to when I got saved. And I'm coming down the hallway, and who do I run into? The judge, Judge Manning. Him and his wife are, are longtime members of Menlo Church. And I run into him. I scared him half to death because, you know, he, I'm sure he's, convicted a lot of people. So I walked out, hey man, nah, this and that. And he's like, whoa, like, you know, like he, he doesn't know if I'm going to hurt him or, but I go I give him a big hug and I told him what had happened and he started crying. Like he's, he's doesn't hear a lot of testimonies of lives that he's changed. And I told him, man, you have no idea what God did that day in the courtroom. You changed my whole entire life. So fast forward about 18 months later, um, so I got sober July 23rd, 2005. I graduated um, a little after 2006. I was living in the Salvation Army, um, the rehab, to about 2000, almost 2008. I'm going, to an, I'm going to an AA meeting in Menlo Park that's run by Menlo Church. And my sponsor and I were having a conversation. I just got laid off. I got back in the Teamsters. I was driving for a company called DHL Express. I don't know if you guys know what DHL is. It's, it's the union version of FedEx, basically. So I was driving for them. Well, 2007, 2008, the economy just completely exploded on itself, right? Well, I got laid off. I was one out of 100,000 employees worldwide from DHL that got laid off. I had no job. And my sponsor told me, oh, this isn't going to last that long. Don't worry about it. He goes, there's a homeless thing down the street where they feed the homeless called Street Church on Tuesday nights after the AA meeting. Once you go down there and serve the homeless, a couple weeks, you'll be back to work. Well... I go down to street church. I run into two guys I used to get high with. I started helping them get into Salvation Army to help them get sober, and they're still sober today. It's amazing, right? Well, a week turned into four years, unfortunately. And two, I don't know if you guys remember. The, that was a crazy time. But what I found out, though, is God is so crazy in what he does. He will shift things so hard to get your attention. He did not want me to go back into being a truck driver. You know, I will tell you something. I, I got saved. I was on fire for the Lord. I got back in the Teamsters, and I started to f start to get back in the world. You know, um, Drew and I, you were talking about this uh, before I came in, uh, well, before I started speaking. It's so easy to get caught up in money. You know, and I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Driving a truck for a living, you can make a lot of money, and I was, I was making a lot of money, and, and I was starting to get back into ch toys and shoes and clothes and and all of a sudden, my, my faith started to drift. Well, all of a sudden, I got laid off, and then I'm here f helping the homeless, and all of a sudden, I felt God just saying, this is where I want you. I'm like, homeless? What? <laughs> like, there's no money in this. <laughs> and uh, God's like, yeah, exactly. I'm going to keep you humble. <laughs> For 16 years, he's kept me very humble. Yeah, but, um, you know, I, so the, the ministry started out of a church called Peninsula Covenant on Farm Hill Boulevard. And I, was, I had moved from Menlo Church to PCC to get closer to the, to the church that started the ministry. About 18 months later, the pastor who started it was, was having his third child. And he said that him and his wife had been praying. And they said that we think that you guys, that you're the new leader for this ministry. And I'm like, I've never led nothing in my life. I've, I have led some things, and I led myself almost into jail for five years, right? Well, all of a sudden, I started, you know, I'm, I'm laid off. I'm working 60, 70 hours, volunteer for the ministry as it is. And next thing I know, um, I found out really fast to run a nonprofit. Churches don't support 
another church's ministry. They just don't. This church would not write a check to PCC in lieu of Street Church. But if you have your own 501c3, then other churches will jump on board. So I started, started talking to some other people about forming a board, forming a 501c3. We started Thursday nights in Menlo Park. And then I went to a, a church called Redwood Church, right? <laughs> Lo and behold, you, I haven't seen you in years, bro. <laughs> and um, I go to Redwood Church, and the pastor that was leading it, I said, hey, I got this idea. I want to start serving the homeless in Redwood City. I want to give back to the area that I took away so much from. And so this pastor believed in what I was doing and a few other pastors. Next thing I know, uh, this church in San Carlos came, called me and said, listen, if you can get a board formed up, we have a benevolence of, of $150,000. We want to give that $150,000 to your, to your 501c3 just for salary, and we'll give it to you uh, increments of, of years. If in three years... You know, God has really called you to be uh, to do this ministry. You shouldn't. You should be fine. Well, here I am, sixteen, almost seventeen years later, and uh, and we serve. You know, actually fifty thousand meals a year. That's all right. It's good though. It's all good because I'm telling you something. We we meet so many walks of life. You know, I was Drew was asking me what Bible verse that I really uh, cling on to is in Matthew twenty five thirty four through forty. Right. We all know that that the the 12 disciples, which ended up becoming 11 disciples, but we all know they were knuckleheads, right? They always, they, 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 Christ was, Christ was constantly showing him how good he is and, and his Holy Spirit to them, and they just could not grasp a hold of, 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 of the power of Christ. And there was this one incident in Matthew where they're asking him about, about taking care of, of the homeless and the sick and the, and the people in the hospitals and, and in the jails, right? And he says, for those who you serve that have the least of these, you're serving me, right? And for me, that makes, that makes more sense than, than I can imagine because I was one of the least of these. I was so broken. I, have no, I had no hope built in me at all. This judge who's never met me in a, in a million years, he's never met me, doesn't know me, gives me this opportunity to get saved. I get saved, and I just want you to know, Almost everybody in my family at the time had restraining orders against me. I robbed everybody in my family, right? Because who do you hurt? You hurt the ones that's closest to you, right? And I, then I ended up getting a relationship back with my parents. And then before my dad died, my sponsor came to me one time and, he, and I was working. Does everybody know what the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous says? Okay. If you don't, I, I suggest you read it. There's a, there's a part in the 12 steps. There's a fourth step. It's called making, you know, taking a, this, so, this moral inventory of yourself and writing down things that you've done that wronged other people and things that they've done to wrong you. I want you to understand something. I was willing to let go of all the resentment in my heart except for my dad. I figured I'm going to own this one. I'm good. God's going to let me take this one to the grave. He's good. He's going to forgive me. He's not going to hold that one against me. Well, <laughs> my sponsor sat down with me, he says, bro, you got to let that go. You got you to forgive. I'm like, I can't. I cannot forgive. Well, he said, do you want to go to heaven or do you want to go to hell? He goes, because resentment in your heart is going to, you're going you're gonna to forfeit the kingdom. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. So I go and I sit down with my dad. And my dad and I ended up having the most unbelievable experience together of, of forgiveness and my dad started crying. He asked for my. He, he apologized to me. I I apologized for all the things I had done to him, all the, out of hatred and, and anger towards him. And then about a year and a half later, he had a heart attack and passed away. But he became my best friend, you know. And um, and you know, it's just interesting because you know this this ministry that I get a blessing to serve in has done so many things in my life. It's brought me my wife. It's brought me my, our son, Isaiah. My wife is also in recovery. Our son, Isaiah, when he was, I met my wife and my son when, when he was three. And he's never seen me high. He's never seen me loaded on anything. And it is hard being a dad. But, you know, the, the, the blessing of it, though, is today, my son wants to be a pastor. He's 17 years old. He wants to have nothing to do with drugs and alcohol. He just loves the Lord. He's, he's at our church right now. He's the drummer on, on our worship band. 
He's, and it's just, it's amazing, right, what God will provide and, 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 and when you give him everything. And my wife loves the homeless as well. You know, we're both, you know, she has, uh, her and her sister have um, two safe houses in, in, in this area for, for domestic violence victims. And it's just, and that all came out of COVID, just so you know. So if anybody wants to know anything more about that, I can share with you after church. But um, it's just amazing what, what things would do. And, you know, and, and Drew, meeting Drew, what, what a blessing because I, I, I knew a, a mutual friend of ours through, through another, another uh, uh, means. And he goes, hey, you got to meet this guy, Drew. He just he loves working with people in jails and this and that. And we sat down. And just to hear Drew's heart, and again, Matthew 25, 34 through 40, the 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 parallels between the people that Drew works with and I work with are just unbelievable, right? Because most of my folks end up in jail, and then they end up in the care of, of someone like Drew, and then the opportunity to share the, the gospel to them and then say, hey, I'm connected to Street Life Ministries, you know, and then, it, you know what I mean? It, it allows our folks to not feel left alone. Um, and then the other thing is, too, is I just want to share with you guys, like that woman that we saw when you and I were having coffee, nowhere in the scripture have I read anything about whether the person's saved or not. I want you to understand something. 95% of the people that I work with are not saved. They're not. And they're fighting it tooth and nail. They want their, they want their sin so bad. But it doesn't mean that I, I'm going to give up. That judge didn't give up on me. Right? You never know what can happen in the last minute. And that's why it's so important with what we do. Because, yes, the food is good. Yes, we hand out lots of clothes and underwear and socks. And we, 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 yeah, we hand out a lot of stuff. But that's kind of like how I am a fisherman. I throw the bait in the water. It's really, really good bait. And then I hope to hook them to get them to accept Jesus Christ. Right? We are very good at getting folks back into mainstream living. We, we average about 25 to 30 people a year saved and back into productive member society. And, um, yeah, so it's, it's just, it's a joy. I love doing what I do. It's obvious why God chose me to do what I do. I mean, the more and more I, if for me, it's a selfish thing. Like I said, I got 19 years sober, and if I ever have the idea that thinking maybe drugs and alcohol have gotten a little bit better, all I have to do is go to the ministry one night and go, ah, okay. It hasn't, it hasn't gotten any better. Um, but we love what we do. Um, just really quick, and I'll, and I'll end with this because I know Drew has something to share. So a couple things about the ministry. So we, we are an outside church. So we don't meet in a building. We meet outdoors. We have Redwood City, Monday, Wednesday, Friday nights. We have Menlo Park Train Station, Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then we have uh, First Christian Church in Palo Alto on Monday nights. And I'm right now in the beginning stages of building a, a, a fourth site in uh, South San Francisco by Seas Candy. Um, the reason why we meet outside with our folks is most of our folks have a lot of mental health issues. On top of the self-medicating with the drug, a lot of our folks have schizophrenia. They're paranoid. They, they, some folks... You know, you'd be really surprised. So some of our folks really, really work hard to disguise themselves as not homeless. They'll go into a Starbucks or a gas station, and they clean themselves up, and they try to stay as much as they can, normal as they can. And then there's some of our folks that have some serious mental health issues, and they smell really, really bad. Well, what ends up happening is, is if I stick them in here and try to feed them, the guy who wants to stay clean is sitting next to the guy who can care less. All the guy that's clean wants to do is just get out of here as fast as he can. Outdoors, it's airy, right? The people feel safer there. They feel their, 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 uh, their, their intensity level is lower. So we have more access to outreach, doing it outside. It helps out a lot. Plus, they have that feeling like, hey, I can go whenever I want. I can go outside the fence, and I can go smoke a cigarette, and then I can come back in. Does that make sense? All right. The other is, is we, we, we ran a campaign about two years ago to buy a building because my wife and I feel like, we, you know, why not? We don't have anything else going on in our lives. Let's buy a building and, and, and start a recovery program. <laughs> oh, Lord Jesus, I hope where they're going safe. Um, so the, there's, in Redwood City, over, over by Five Points Tires, there is a Hungarian church that's been there for 60-something years. 
So we just bought the building, and we're in the very. We just got the blueprints. We got the okay from the city. So we're right in the very beginning stages of remodeling the church into a twelve-month in, inpatient men's recovery program. So, oh boy, this. Lord Jesus, wherever they go, that's, I hope they're safe and okay. Amen. Um, so we're going to launch uh, the first ever in San Mateo County men's recovery program that will be all gospel-based. So we're, we, it'll, be, it'll be like Salvation Army. Yes, it'll be like Salvation Army kind of on steroids. Um, just so you guys know, and really quick, and I know I'm going long. I'm sorry, Drew. Okay. Um, <laughs> you got outvoted, bro. <laughs> so just so you know, secular recovery which is all here in the Bay Area. There's a lot of secular recovery programs. And I, I believe in 12 steps. I believe, trust me, I work the 12 steps. Secular recovery, if you take 10 people into a secular recovery program, and when they graduate, within five years, um, uh, out of those 10 people, nine of them have already gone back out. Christian recovery you bring the same 10 people into a Christian program, and they run through the Christian program. After five years, nine of them are still sober. It's all about the gospel. It's all about sharing the word of God. It's, it's all about, I'm telling you, I know it works. I went through Salvation Army. I know, how it, I know that the, the, the Christian way of recovery is the way to go. you got to teach these guys how to live life over again. And who loves them more than anybody, and that's the Lord not, not, not man, but God. And, and I'm telling you, it works. So that's what we're going to do. It's going to be a very cool program. There will be opportunities uh, uh, in, afoot uh, that I will share with Drew down the road uh, for anybody who wants to help mentor or teach the Word of God or help. Uh, just you know, Some of our folks are going to come into the program with a fourth grade reading level. Right, and they're going to be going through the Bible. So, if anybody here likes to be a tutor, you want to help help our guys read and go through the Bible. I mean, if that's one of your gifts, if you're a teacher, if you know how to teach finances, any of that kind of stuff, let Drew know. Um, let me know. I'll give you my card after church. Um, but we're going to need the whole thing. We really want to teach these men how to be men, how to be fathers, how to be how to be productive men, how to go back out in the workforce, how to get a job, how to how to hold on to a job. Right? So we're really excited about that. But other than that, that's pretty much it, brother. I can go, I can go for about four more hours if you want, though. <laughs> you said keep it short.